All right, we're back with video three for chapter 16, thermodynamics. You want to make sure that you've got something in front of you to write down a couple of key equations as we move through this chapter, starting right off the bat, right? That one down there at the bottom. Okay. The whole point of this chapter, right? The key idea so far is understanding spontaneity, okay? the difference between spontaneity and kinetics, right? Speed and the idea of entropy and how to predict, how to calculate entropy, right? And how to predict if there's an increase in entropy. But the, we said at the end of video two there that the hard and fast rule for determining if a reaction is spontaneous is that it has to have an increase in the free entropy of the universe, right? which is exceptionally hard to do, right? Consider the whole universe every time you're thinking about a chemical reaction. So using just the second law of thermodynamics is difficult, right? Because in order to determine the universe, we have to think about the system and the surroundings. So what we have now here in 16.4 is a better tool to predict the spontaneity of a reaction, okay? That's called Gibbs free energy, represented by the variable G. Okay, and the Gibbs free energy is equal to H, the enthalpy, minus T, the Kelvin temperature, multiplied by S, the entropy. Okay. But if we are looking at a change, right, at constant temperature and pressure, if those aren't changing, the delta G for any chemical reaction is equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? No delta T here because it's a constant temperature. Okay. And this is something that refers to the system specifically okay now we don't have to think about the universe delta g is just thinking about the system not to say we can't tie it in to the universe right if you look at this slide here it shows you a combination of all the equations that we've seen before in this chapter all right delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s you don't have to necessarily know this deviation or derivation sorry but that comes down all the way to the bottom delta g is equal to negative t delta s of the universe yeah. Now, we said before, if a reaction is spontaneous, it has a positive delta S of the universe. So now, because that's multiplied by T, Kelvin temperature also always has to be positive, but it's got a negative out front. Now, our sign has switched. For something to be spontaneous, it has to have a positive delta S of the universe or a negative delta G of the system, a negative Gibbs free energy is a spontaneous reaction. Key idea from this chapter, okay? And that's all summarized nicely in table 16.3. For something to be spontaneous, positive delta S of the universe, negative delta G. Flip those signs and it's non-spontaneous, right? Or if either of them happen to be equal to zero, then you have a system that's perfectly reversible at equilibrium. Okay, so that middle column here is the new information that's now introduced from 16.4. <clears throat> Just like our enthalpy and our entropy, okay, the Gibbs free energy change is a state function. So that means, like we've said before, it depends only on the final and the initial states, right? Final minus initial. So we can calculate free energy change just like we've done before. Okay? We did it earlier for entropy, and now we can do it for Gibbs free energy any of these thermodynamic variables, right? That variable of the products multiplied by their stoichiometric coefficients minus that variable of the reactants multiplied again by their coefficients. So we did it in chapter five for enthalpy. We did it in video two for entropy. You should have tried that one out. And here you can do it to calculate Gibbs free energy the same way. Contained within the slides here is an example of how to do that. Okay, so you can try this one for practice. Okay, we've got the decomposition of mercury 2 oxide into liquid mercury in half an O2. Remember with these thermochemical equations, it is okay to use those non-whole number coefficients. Okay. So try this one out. There's actually two ways that you can solve this problem. Because you're given the delta G information, take the delta G of the products minus the delta G of the reactants. Okay. That's the equation that was shown on this pass light right here down at the bottom. Okay, so you can do that. You should get a final answer of 58.4 kilojoules. And the fact that it's a positive value, positive 
tells you that that reaction is non-spontaneous. But there's actually a second way to do this problem as well. That's really good practice as well. Right? Calculate the delta H change, right? products minus reactants. Calculate the delta S change, products minus reactants. Okay? And then those two values, after you calculate delta H and delta S, you can plug them in to this equation. Okay? You've also got to know the temperature, which it tells you it's happening at 298, 298 Kelvin. So you can plug that delta H and delta S into that formula, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and calculate delta G that way. And you should again get an answer of positive 58.4 kilojoules. Two ways to do it. You should know how to do both for the chapter 16 quiz. Those answers should always agree with one another. Two methods to get the same answer. The only thing you need to look out for okay, as you're doing that second type of calculation is notice here kilojoules, here kilojoules. Entropy values are typically reported in joules per Kelvin mole. Okay, so if you're using the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S equation, you need to first convert these entropy values to kilojoules, right? Dividing them all by a thousand. So pause the video now, try those. And then we'll pick back up with some other types of calculations. Okay. What if we don't have something at a specific set temperature, right? Because our chemical reaction in theory can occur at any temperature. The freezing of water, for example, is not spontaneous at room temperature, like 22, 23 degrees Celsius, but it is spontaneous at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So the spontaneity of a process does depend on the temperature, okay? Because it's in this equation as well. We just saw that enthalpy and entropy tie in to delta G, okay? but overall temperature affects it as well. Temperature is always positive, okay? but what if our entropy change ended up being negative then i've got a minus positive times a negative minus a negative right that means this whole thing is positive so there's four possibilities even though temperature is always positive your enthalpy value your h can be negative or positive and your entropy value s can be negative or positive which is four possibilities all summarized in this table the four scenarios we have now if something is exothermic, right? Meaning it has a negative delta H and it has a positive delta S, it's increasing the entropy. Those are both favorable. That means our reaction always has a negative Gibbs free energy. So they're always spontaneous, no matter what. Flip side of that, if a reaction is endothermic and has a decrease in entropy, those are always positive delta Gs. So they are never spontaneous. Yep. But those other two, if you've got something that's endothermic but has an increase in entropy or is exothermic but has a decrease in entropy, those flip their spontaneity at a set temperature. At some temperatures they'll be spontaneous, at other temperatures they'll be non-spontaneous, yep. which is what this slide 44 is telling us about. Right? There's always some specific temperature where it turns out delta G is equal to zero, and that's where it flips. You figure out what temperature corresponds to a delta G of zero, and then on either side of that temperature, one side it's spontaneous, the other side it's non-spontaneous. And there's an example at the end of the slides to demonstrate that. It's also shown on this slide here as well, 45 by my count, yours might be a little bit different. Okay. If, like I mentioned before, there's a situation where it's always spontaneous, exothermic and an increase in entropy. There's a situation where it's always non-spontaneous. Okay? These things are a decrease in entropy and endothermic. But for those other two situations, there's a temperature where they flip from being non-spontaneous to spontaneous. Okay? And we'll see an example at the end how to calculate that. That's a really important idea, knowing how to do that math. For a quiz. How about equilibrium? 
tying these ideas in from back in chapter 13, right, when equilibrium was introduced. We said that free energy, right, having a negative Gibbs free energy, for example, is a measure of a reactant driving force. It means it's spontaneous. Right? So if something has a negative delta G, that means that the reaction going from reactants to products is favorable. The driving force is in the forward direction. And back in chapter 13, we said that a different way. We said a large value of delta K favored the products, moved the reaction forward from reactants to products, spontaneous processes. Okay. What about the opposite of all those? If it's a positive delta G, that means it's a non-spontaneous reaction. That's where we have small Ks, right? Driving force is actually going from products to reactants. And if either of them well, delta G here specifically is equal to zero, then our system's at equilibrium. We used Q the same way, as I just mentioned with K, and we can tie all those ideas together right, with two equations. Here's the first one. Right? The delta G at any temperature right, is equal to delta G naught, the standard state, right, plus R, right here, 8.314 joules per mole times Kelvin, T, Kelvin temperature, natural log of Q, the reaction quotient. Okay, that allows you to determine delta G and figure out how that reaction's moving. If you have Q, you can calculate delta G. If you have delta G, you can calculate Q, provided you're given delta G of the standard state. Okay, so this practice problem right here walks you through calculating that. Okay, ask the free energy under the specific conditions. How do we go about that? First, I calculate Q like I would have in chapter 13, and then I go back and use this equation plus the delta G naught that it gives me to calculate delta G and figure out if that's going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Okay, so again, pause the video, give that one a shot. Yep. And then we've got a couple more equations. I'll also upload a separate video showing how to solve that problem stepwise if any of this isn't making sense. A couple final equations for us, okay, if I'm thinking about a system at equilibrium specifically, right? if we're at equilibrium at chapter 13, we said that means Q is equal to K. In this chapter, we've said that means delta G is equal to zero. Okay, so if I plug those ideas in, I get this new equation right here. This is the one I want you to know. Delta G naught, right? the delta G at the standard state is equal to negative RT natural log of K, which is a really important equation because it ties together a couple of essential ideas from multiple chapters. And we can use, if we have now delta G information, we can use that to solve for an equilibrium constant. So now we have another table here that summarizes what we already knew about delta G and we're hopefully remembering from chapter 13, right? K and delta G can be related to one another, our reactions are always going to shift to establish equilibrium, yeah, which is what this slide, which actually now that I see that has terrible quality, right, just know your reactions always shift to establish equilibrium. Don't worry too much about the graphs that are shown on those two. Okay. As I mentioned at the end here, this final slide has the data to calculate the temperature at which the reaction becomes spontaneous. You're given entropy information up top, keep in mind joules. You're given enthalpy information at the bottom, keep in mind kilojoules, right? Those units don't match, so one of them's gonna have to be converted. You use that information to calculate delta S and delta H. Then you've got to calculate delta G naught, okay? Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S and solve for the temperature, right? And I will upload another video showing how to do that as well. And that concludes chapter 16.